So I'm sure those of you that have watched Star Trek growing up remember the words of the captain, Captain James T. Kirk, which said, skin the final, fr space the final frontier. <laughs> <laughs> I wish he did actually said that. Uh, by the end of today's talk, I hope to convince you that for us humans, the skin is actually the final frontier. The skin is an incredible organ, and this is what separates us from the external environment. It also happens to be the largest organ of our body, and it lives with us for as long as we live. While other organs, like the heart or the liver, can actually fail with age, no one ever dies of skin failure, unless, of course, they are in an accident or ha happen to have some genetic skin disorder. And yet this incredible organ regenerates itself every three weeks for as long as we live. By some estimates, we lose about a million cells a day, and yet there are no holes in our body as far as we know. And so this is an absolutely incredible organ to study. And what is even more fascinating is that the epidermis, which is the topmost layer of the skin, is about as thin as saran wrap. So this is what is separating you from the external environment. So across the animal kingdom, the skin comes in a variety of colors and shapes, like the stripes on the zebra, to the spots on the leopard, to the incredible colors of the tree frogs of the Amazon, as well as the fish in the coral reefs. So many animals are actually able to change the color of their skin to match their environment like this leaf-tailed gecko on the left, which really looks like a dead leaf. Or other animals like the tiger are able to match their skin tone to the surroundings, like this tiger that's roaming around in tall grasslands. So both of these are examples of the skin being used for camouflage. In humans, the skin actually is determined by a pigment called melanin. And what is really, really important to understand is that this is an evolutionary adaptation, and it is a protective mechanism for humans against the harmful effects of ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So areas of the world that see much more sunlight have people with darker skins compared to areas that receive less sunlight. And this is a really important point because all of us sitting in this room have different skin colors, and in fact, we have a veritable rainbow of sepia colors, but at the molecular and the cellular level, we are all exactly the same. So how does this incredible organ develop? How are these cells kept together? Where are these stem cells that are constantly regenerating the skin every three weeks or so residing within the skin? So these are questions that have actually fascinated me for the last 15 years or so not just because this is sort of an interesting question or as an academic question, but because when these processes go wrong, it can lead to devastating skin disorders. And in fact, in my lab, we use the mouse as a model system, as a proxy to study some of these issues. So I just told you that the skin is the largest organ, but what you'll be really surprised to know is that it actually develops, or this barrier function within the skin actually develops very, very late in gestation. The thought is that most mammals develop within the protective environment of the amniotic fluid, and they don't actually need their skin as they're developing. And so shown here are a series of mouse embryos from about three and a half days before they're born to about a day and a half before they're born. And all we've done is dip them in a blue dye. So the animals that are about three and a half days from birth are not able to exclude this blue dye, so they turn completely blue. The animals that are going to be born a day and a half later are actually completely able to exclude this blue dye. So this is just a proxy for us to know that the barrier in the skin develops really very late. And this is exactly the same in humans. So human fetuses develop this barrier quite late in gestation, around the third trimester which is why babies that are born prematurely have a problem with their skin, and they are prone to infections, and which is why they actually need to be kept in incubators. I just told you about how important the barrier is, and of course, it keeps things from outside. But, but what is absolutely incredible is that the skin is just crawling with bacteria. In fact, an average human has trillions 
of bacteria, fungi, and viruses, together called as the microbiome. Shown here is a really startling image of an average eight-year-old kid, could be my kid, who was playing outside. And this is just the bacteria and fungi that's growing on our surface, on the skin surface. So you're looking at this, and I think it's quite alarming, but also beautiful. And you're asking yourself, if all of this is floating around on our skin, then how come we don't get sick every time we cut ourselves? So there's a couple of explanations for that. One is that most of the stuff that's found in the skin is actually not harmful to us. And the skin actually has developed tremendous tolerance for these bacteria and fungi. But the other side of this is that the skin has an incredible defense mechanism called the immune system. So these are cells that exist within the skin. And these are the soldiers that keep that get into the line to start fighting any infection that occurs. So the minute the skin barrier is breached, these cells are mobilized, and then they can go and clear out the infection within a couple of days. Many times we don't even know that this is actually happening right under our skin. But this process actually is not completely perfect. So what happens is that if you have a really large uh, cut to yourself, it can cause scarring. And the reason for that is that these very same immune cells that can help to clear the infection can also change the tissue surrounding the cut. And that can lead to scarring. But that's a really small price to pay for an immune system that's working fantastically well. So this process by which the immune cells will fight off infection is called inflammation. Inflammation itself turns out to be a double-edged sword. If you have too little of inflammation, it can cause systemic infections. If you have too much of it, it leads to chronic diseases. So in fact, chronic inflammation, the inflammation that never resolves itself, is at the root of many, many skin disorders that ail humans. For example, cancer, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and other autoimmune disorders. And unlike bacterial infections, which can be cleared up, Inflammation, chronic inflammation, the uh, tissue damage is at the heart of chronic inflammation. So it starts with damage, which leads to inflammation, which leads to some more damage. And it sets up this really vicious cycle, which really doesn't resolve itself. So very often, like this case on the right in rheumatoid arthritis, by the time you've actually detected that there is an issue, there's a tremendous amount of tissue damage that has already occurred. And all you can do is to help clear up some of this infection, but you can never clear up the damage. And so the question that really interests all of us is, what is the very earliest events that set up this damage? So recent work in my laboratory at INSTEM has uncovered a mouse model that we are using to uh, understand these questions. What is really incredible about this model is that the tissue damage and the inflammation that are at the heart of so many chronic diseases happen even before the mouse is born. So I'm just going to take you through this. On the left is just a normal mouse skin with very few immune cells. On the right is the skin from our damaged mouse, which has damaged skin and has an incredible number of immune cells, which is causing even more damage. What is really exciting about this model for us is that we can actually take this and go back in time and ask what was the very first events that started, that set up this, infl uh, this inflammatory cascade and this vicious cycle. And in fact, that's exactly what we're doing now. So what we're doing is we're using our mouse model as a proxy to understanding what sets up this chronic inflammation. We're doing really cool stuff like giving the very same drugs that you would use to treat rheumatoid arthritis. We're giving them to our mice and asking how soon can this infl inflammation and this uh, tissue damage be cleared up? And so in that sense, we're really using this as a proxy to study other human diseases. And so at the end of this journey, I hope that I have convinced you that in fact, the final frontier is our skin. Thank you.